Good afternoon. Um, we bring you greetings from Galveston Island, Texas. We are truly excited to be here and thank the Texas Restaurant Association for the invitation. I'm Tommy Boudreaux and I chair Galveston, Afri Galveston Historical Foundation African American Heritage Committee. I am one of the authors of our latest book, Lost Restaurants of Galveston African American Community. With Alice Gadsden, Greg Sanford, and Ella Lewis, who can't be here today. We're all BOIs, including our chef, born on the island. So we are very, very proud, always proud, to tell you something about our city. It's, um, we began the cookbook, uh, we began is, uh, make, uh, having a cookbook. We were going to collect recipes handed down over the generations and uh, compile a cookbook of Galvestonians' fine foods. Well, we, I guess you would say, we, we ran into a storm because for many of our leaders, no longer had those possessions because of Hurricane Ike. But for so many of them, they had worked at some of the restaurants or they had done other type of work, had been chefs or waitresses and so on. And they began to tell us stories about their owners, chefs, and cooks, and the wait staff. So we found ourselves gradually revolving to the lives of the restaurant owners, uh, the chefs, cooks, and staff. All of us have a favorites. In fact, we all probably have two or three favorites, and, and, and I also have favorites. But what I'd like to do today is um, share one of the stories that really uh, impressed me. And this is um, a short, short version of Tip Top Cafe and Mr. Courtney Bernard Murray Sr. Courtney was born in Grand Canyon, Louisiana, in 1902. His family moved to Galveston when he was only three years old. When he was old enough, he found jobs to help support the family. And in 1939, when he had his own family, he decided to purchase property at 2607 Avenue F, and he opened Tip Top Cafe. Courtney wasn't a cook. He didn't cook at all. According to his granddaughter, you just didn't want to dine when you knew he was doing the cooking but he hired a great kitchen staff. The cafe was open 24 hours. He was a man of many hats. Courtney believed in self-improvement, offering his staff an opportunity to take business courses, secretarial courses. A Mrs. Phillips, Odessa Phillips, was a waitress back in the 50s. And she took advantage of that opportunity to go to business school or take business classes. And she said when she moved to Hiscock, she opened her own business. And today, she still thanks Mr. Murray for helping her, giving her that opportunity. Keep in mind that a number of the people who came to Galveston came with, with very little. Many of the families moved to Galveston from um, they say the cotton and um, sugar cane fields of Texas and Louisiana. So for them to come and work menial jobs and continue to want to do more, it was just really fantastic. Many of them went on to do many things. Mr. Murray was one who also believed in supporting the community and supporting those things that he thought were right. He sold poll tax and he encouraged the community to vote. 
but he didn't campaign for any candidate. He was a voter registrar, deputy. He stayed abreast of city issues. And because his cafe was near the city business district and Galveston City Hall, many of his customers were council members as well as those who influenced city decisions. So he, he would always have an ear to what was going on in the city. He donated to nonprofits that supported the needy. He was the owner of a youth football and baseball team. During World War II, Courtney provided free entertainment for the soldiers stationed at Camp Wallace in Galveston, Texas, and discounted meals whenever they dined at his cafe. Mr. Murray also had a pig farm in Hitchcock, Hitchcock, Texas. But his granddaughter, Tony, stated, being a city boy, that adventure didn't last very long. Mr. Murray, uh, Murray, as I said, was a man of many hats. He was a promoter, bringing the top African-American talent at the time during the 40s, 50s, and 60s <laughs> to Galveston City Auditorium. And here are just a few of the people that Mr. Murray brought to Galveston Island. Sarah Vaughn, Count Basie and his band, Billy Eckstein, Cap Calloway and his Cotton Club Orchestra, Nat King Cole, Duke Ellington, and Ella James, just a few. Tickets were sold to anyone who wanted to attend the concert. And of course, the artist would always dine in his cafe after performance. According to Mrs. Phillips, they would not only dine, but they would continue to jam until the wee hours of the morning. Courtney also uh, did a lot of other things in the community, supporting a number of uh, nonprofit organizations. However, unfortunately, the Tip Top Clothes, Tip Top Cafe closed during the late 1960s when the city of Galveston implemented eminent domain on his property. Though he was compensated, his granddaughter stated that he didn't want to start all over again. Courtney continued to support community, and in the 80s, he had a part-time job with the Job Corps, a Job Corps program for young, young people from 18 to 25 years old. When asked why he was still working, he replied, I just like helping young people. On oh, November 23rd, 1988, Courtney was presented a humanitarian award from the Texas governor, William P. Clements, Jr. for his accomplishments, contributions to the community and support of the military. Mr. Courtney Bernard Murray remained active until May 29, 2001, when he passed at the age of 99. Now you notice I didn't mention any recipes or any food. Well, they had the food. In fact, Mrs. Phillips and as well as Mr. Murray's granddaughter said they had an extensive menu. But none of them could tell me, you know, any particular uh, dish that was served where they could share a recipe. But I did find, <coughs> I did speak with them. Tommy McNeil, who lived near the Tip Top. Now, Tip Top was open 24 hours. They sold breakfast 24 hours. And he told me, he said, they made the best scrambled eggs. They were so good. They were better than my mother's, but I never told her that. So in the book, Mrs. Phillips did, well, she will give you a list of things that were sold. But Mr. Murray was a man, I would just say he was the man. 
because he did so many things for the community. And for him to get a reward from the governor of the Texas, I think that he accomplished a lot. So thank you. Uh, that's, he's one of my favorites. Okay. okay. Alice? I'd like to highlight Mr. Melvin Sidney's Sydney, drive-in. It's not on right now, but in the late 1940s, a new concept of dining was popular in Galveston. This was the drive-in restaurant. Mr. Melvin Sidney embraced this new idea as Sidney's Drive-In. Mr. Melvin Sidney was born in Cedar Lane, Texas in 1918. As a youth, he came to Galveston to continue his education. At that time, African Americans, this was the only opportunity for African Americans to obtain a high school diploma. He graduated from the historic Central High School in 1936. And after graduation, he worked on the docks as a longshoreman, and his favorite thing to do was cook. His cooking ability led to the opening of Sydney's Drive-In, a drive-in with car hops and a small dining room. A small dining room to encourage customers to stay in their cars for service. Sydney's Drive-In was located on the north side, as most African-American business were at that time. The menu was simple and focused on traditional foods like hamburgers, cheeseburgers, french fries, malts, and shakes. And neighbors would walk blocks to, as they call it, the Big Burger House, as it was called. This was a place for students to gather after the Central High football games, friends meeting friends, or an outing with the family after church. Sydney's Drive-In was a social outlet for Galveston's African-American community. Mr. Sydney's business closed in 1966 and when he retired, and several years later, the building was torn down. Mr. Melvin Sydney died in 2004 at the age of 85. I think that's a picture of Mr. Wade Watkins. And he's one of the chefs that we highlighted in our book. Wade A. Watkins. He was a native of Leon County, born in 1925 in Oakwood, Texas. After serving in the Army in 1948 and the food service in San Antonio, he decided to come to Galveston. His first job in Galveston was at the Buccaneer Hotel. At that time, the Buccaneer was located on the historic Seawall Boulevard. <coughs> Mr. Watkins, knowing that he may be laid off during the off season, joined the kitchen staff of the historic Gatos Restaurant. He survived that winter season and remained a major part of the Gatos kitchen staff. He was soon named the restaurant's executive chef. Wade's signature bis is still on the menu at Gatto's, and they have a dining room named after him. Wade's career as Gatto's chef expanded over three generations of the Gatto family. His peers held him with the highest respect as he received numerous cl culinary awards attending the La Varine Cooking School of Paris, France, and for many years was a member of the Texas Self Association. After 44 years of service to Gatto's restaurant, Mr. Watkins retired to serve his church and neighbors. There's a picture of him there. In 1998, he and his wife were honored for their service to their community. And in 2013, Mr. Watkins died at the age of 88. Okay, Greg, Greg, it's up to you. I would like to introduce you to Clary's Restaurant. Mr. Clary Milburn was born on October 10, 1940, in Opelousas, Louisiana. He passed away in Galveston, surrounded by his family, on January 31, 2016. 
But what I'd like to do this, this afternoon for a short period of time is give you a glimpse into that little hyphen between his birth date and the day he passed away. Mr. Milburn was born, his parents were sharecroppers. So immediately he got a lesson how to work hard, hard work, good work ethic. In 1957, he moved to Galveston. His first job was at John Seeley Hospital, but y'all probably know that more today as the University of Texas Medical Branch, UTMB. It's there he met his wife, Doris, and they had a marriage that lasted 52 years until she passed away in 2012. But while Mr. Milburn was working at UTMB, he started off in a maintenance custodial staff. He made it, started making his way toward the hospitality room, and there he started helping the chefs back there fix sandwiches for the, staff, the UTMB staff and faculty members at lunchtime. In fact, it got to be where some of the people would wait till Mr. Milburn got there before they put their order in because they wanted him to fix their meal for them at lunch. And from there, he kind of moved into some other opportunities. He started a cleaning service, but he also did some catering. And all this went on from probably the early 1960s to about the mid 1970s. And then in 1977, he had an opportunity to open a restaurant in Galveston. And so in August of 1977, Clary's opened. And it didn't open on the beachfront like a lot of the seafood restaurants are in Galveston. Just as you come over the causeway into Galveston, this restaurant was just off to the right there by the, uh, out by the Galveston Daily News plant. So his restaurant opened in, in 1977, and he had a, an immediate uh, influx of customers because they had used him as catering for when he did his catering business so many years before. So when his restaurant opened, a lot of his children started working with him. Dwayne and Wayne are with us today, and they started working at the restaurant at an early age. Dwayne probably worked at every capacity you can at a restaurant. In fact, if he listed all of that on a, a resume, that'd probably take one or two pages just to list every job he had at the restaurant. And he's wearing his dad's treasured hat today, so I just wanted to make sure I pointed that out. But his restaurant went strongly. It started in 1977. Uh, if some of y'all are familiar with the movie, movie Evening Shade, a lot of the scenes uh, from that movie were filmed in a restaurant. In fact, uh, Evening Shade's the kind of the spinoff of uh, Terms of Endearment, if y'all remember watching that movie. But they had a lot of the scenes in that movie were filmed in his restaurant. But then he just had a variety of different ways to make seafood. I'm, I'm sure all y'all have watched the movie Forrest Gump. And in Forrest Gump, you remember Bubba talking about the dip, all the different ways you could make shrimp? Mr. Milburn knew all those, and he probably knew a few that Bubba didn't know. So he had a, a variety of different ways to, to, to make shrimp. And like I said, his family members were always involved in, in the restaurant business with him. And this went on for several more years. And then something tragic happened in Galveston in 2008. I think they kind of turned the tide on a lot of the different businesses in the city. Hurricane Ike struck, and the restaurant took in eight foot of water. So imagine standing up and then putting your hand up as high as you can. It was still high on that, it got into the restaurant. So after they got the restaurant cleaned and they went back into business, they, they reopened again and continued serving people. Now they had, the restaurant stayed open from 1977 to, until 2015. Okay, so all that, all that different time, and he had an influx of customers in. Muhammad Ali visited there, Clyde Drexler, Rudy Tomjanovich. He had a lot of the Houston sports celebrities that made their way to Clary's restaurant. Um, but the one thing that I remember the most about the restaurant was the repeat customers he would have. And when you went back in there, he always remembered your visit before. He's the kind of person that had a photographic memory. If he'd, you'd been in his restaurant, he remembered you and come and struck up a conversation with you. And, uh, that's, and, and a lot of people have made that comment about him over the years. Well, starting in the early part of 2015, Mr. Milburn's health started failing. And he started spending less and less time at the restaurant. And the decision was made by the family in late 
uh, December of 2015 to shut the restaurant down. And then, then unfortunately, he passed away just within a month of that. But I think the best way to sum up his life, and I've, and I've got to use a quote from Charles Barkley. So if y'all know who Charles Barkley is, you know how he's very outspoken on a lot of different issues, but he always tells you exactly what he thinks. And one of Charles Barkley's teammates got elected to the NBA Hall of Fame in 2019. And so the, the, uh, the, his teammate's name was Bobby Jones. And I went on Wikipedia and I looked up Bobby Jones and I saw what Charles Barkley said about him. Charles Barkley made the following comment about uh, his teammate Bobby Jones. He said, if everybody in the world was like Bobby Jones, the world would have no trouble. And after my countless interviews with different people who had worked with Clary's, who had visited Clary's, and know Mr. Milburn, I feel the same way about Mr. Milburn. If everybody in the world was like Mr. Milburn, the world would have no problems. And I think that's probably one of the ultimate compliments you can give a person, not only as a restaurateur, which he was very well at, but he was even better humanitarian, how he treated everybody else. And I think that says a lot. You know, it's real difficult for me since I started working on this to even call him Claire anymore. I have to call him Mr. Milburn. I just, you know, you have that gentleman respect after you've read about somebody and known somebody. And he, even though he's, he's passed on now, his legacy will live on the, forever in the lives of the people that he touched. And his, Dwayne and Wayne are with us today, and they can, they're attributed to his, his legacy and how that will continue even after their generation. Thank you, Sos. Okay. Turn it over to you. Mic test one, two. Mic test one, two. Thank you. Thank you, the panel. Thank you all. Thank TRA and everybody here that's making this event possible. Let's give them a round of applause first, everybody. Also, like to thank my assistant, my younger twin brother. I got him by five minutes but I am the oldest. I want to thank him also for joining me here on this panel. Um, a little brief story about uh, Wayne and I. Of course, we are uh, the son of Clary and Doris Milburn, my grandfather, also grandsons of a sharecropper. And we started working at the age of six in my father's janitorial service cleaning uh, garbage cans and ashtrays and mopping floors. So at the age of six, we really started really working with my dad. And we haven't stopped since. 60, we're now just celebrating a 60-year-old birthday. And we're, um, over the period of time, once the restaurant closed and the unemployment ran out, we said, what are we going to do? And we started our catering business. And if that, we found if that wasn't successful, we'll start serving the Lord. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but what we have here prepared is our Leonville Creole. It's a tomato-based Creole sauce. And we added shrimp, sausage, and ground beef. We also have sauteed vegetables such as bell peppers, onions, mushrooms, diced tomatoes. So it's all, we mix it all together. And the reason why we chose this particular entree because it was one of my dad's favorite dishes. Uh, we came to title it Leonville Creole because of the priest came in, his name was Father LeBeau. And he said, Clary, won't you fix me a Creole dish? And this is where this recipe my dad came from. Uh, this is where it all began. We also do certain items, the lump crab meat au gratin. We do French-style grilled oysters. We do oysters picayune. We do stuffed red snapper. We also do the seafood shrimp gumbo. We do the leger. We do a lot of things with our uh, catering company. But a little more brief about our upcoming, um, it's six of us. And again, I uh, want to thank that, that brother for uh, 
mentioning we was in this movie called Evening Star. The big host of the movie was Jack Nicholson. Nicholas. Nicholson. Yeah, Jack Nicholas. And uh, I actually have a I actually have proof that I was in that movie, supposed to have been. <laughs> That's me. I had a little hair, and I was a little heavier then. <laughs> but, but here, now here's a picture here. That's with Jack. Uh, we had to sign a form saying we cannot take their picture, and neither do not ask them for an autograph. But me, I said, oh, no, Mr. Jack, I got to get you. So he turned around the corner, and there I was. I took his picture. And once the flash cleared his eyes, he said, who was that? I said, it's me, Dwayne, Jack. He said, oh, I don't know you that well. I asked him for his signature, and so he refused to sign it. But he's still one of my favorite actors. But uh, uh, to go on, um, Wayne and I, we was in the business for... Uh, 37 years before it closed. Uh, I worked there, Wayne worked there, my younger brother Dex, he was also the chef there. Uh, my sister Rosetta, she was over the finance department. Also had another sister, Angela, who also worked at the restaurant. Now this is where the kicker come in. That younger sister, you know there's always one in the family, that younger sister, she just laid back and just sat and waited. <laughs> she sat and waited, but, uh, and we'll talk about her later. Just hold her name in thought. But uh, uh, after, um, we went through a storm called Alicia in 1982. And that put a little harm into the production of the business. Then we also went through another hurricane uh, called Hurricane Ike. That was a devastating uh, uh, um, storm that caused an effect on the business. But it's two things that really put a damper on the production of Clary's Restaurant. Listen to me. Being an African-American owned business, sometimes you, you have an effect of societal issues when you operate a business. We worked hard, I felt we were good at what we did, and we, we, we really focused on great food, clean atmosphere, and great service. That was our three main important topics of goal to in running this operation. But what put the biggest damper on our business, it, wasn't, it really wasn't the, it wasn't the fire, because it caught fire one time too. So we had two hurricanes and a fire. The biggest disaster or harm that affected our business, one was a result of that O.J. Simpson trial. Surprisingly, that O.J. Simpson trial for two or three weeks, we didn't get anybody in. I said, I, I know OJ, but uh, OJ not my friend. <laughs> OJ, I said, okay. I said, well, all right, we just, we got to wait. Because, you know, this, uh, this is really important to us. What we do is very important to us. So we are able to hang in there and weather that storm. And sometimes even doing so, we had to sometimes not get paid for a while. So we had to really sacrifice paychecks and try to just to make sure the light stayed on. You tried to make sure that the operation still kept going. And another issue that really affected the business was when Barack Obama became President of the United States. Literally, the business was literally crickets for weeks. I said, I was happy he was president too. But those are the two most surprising times in that era 
that it really affected us financially. And, but, you know, we weathered it, we, we, we went with our paychecks, and we still was able to continue. We, one thing we knew, we had to keep the lights on, we had to keep having supplies, we had to pay for insurance, and just weather this thing out. So it's, it's important that, uh, you know, uh, yes, we, we did very well during those three decades. Benefited, he benefited, he had two Trans Ams brand new. And I had a little Camaro. But financially, we really, really benefited in this, this wonderful industry called the food service industry. Wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. It's, I, 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 I couldn't think of doing anything else. Good to see you, Paco. Great, great friend of the family, man. Y'all give a hand for Paco. Awesome man. Great chef. Very great friend of my dad. And man, I love you. Love you. But, um, what, but uh, those, those two times, but even doing that, the, the people start coming back, and we start, we welcome them with great arms, and it was just a, a beautiful thing to see how it evolved. And, and in life, sometimes when you're in, a, in, a, in the restaurant industry, there are going to be the ups, and there's going to be the downs. Even working with my dad, oh my goodness. He was hard on us. He was tough on us. He didn't sell it for less. Matter of fact, at work, we didn't even call him dad. I said, uh, Mr. Clary. <laughs> but I really appreciate that hard work he, still, he instilled in us. So for those young entrepreneurs who decide to work with your family member, would I recommend it? Of course. But I will also say it's not going to be easy. He was tougher on us than he was on some of the other employees, but that's okay. It made us great men. It made us great fathers. He's a father of four. I'm a father of four, and we love our children. We try to raise them right. We try to work them with that same act as work hard, work hard, work hard. My children don't want to work with me. They say, no, you work too hard. One minute. one minute. Okay, he said, I got one minute. <laughs> um, but let's see here. Overall, my Aunt Alice, I got to mention my Aunt Alice. Woo! When you go in that kitchen, you better know what you're talking about with my, my, with my Aunt Alice. She's from Louisiana, and she speaks a different kind of French. And she ain't a Christian. <laughs> but... I love her. She put out some of the best, the eggplant dressing with crab meat. She, she does all our sauces. She does all the dessert. We had homemade salad dressing. We did the homemade uh, um, tartar sauce. Matter of fact, where's the tartar sauce? We brought our own gallon of homemade tartar sauce. I wish we could have gave it all away, but we made the homemade tartar sauce, cocktail sauce, blue cheese dressing, Italian, Thousand Island Ranch. We made all this from scratch. Thanks to the, my aunt who made that particular part of the business that much more special. Because when you have that fresh food, oh, I got to talk about, we got our fish locally. Where's the game warden? He's not in here. Okay. We got our fish locally. The guy would come up to the back of the restaurant because it was overlooked the water. It's one of the most beautiful scenes with the cattails and the ducks and the turtles. One time a, a, a shark came up through there, and that's a true story. But we used to get out. The fishermen would come up through the back on a boat, and we would open the back door, and they would load these live fish on a tray, and we would run the fish through the dining room. And they would flap, and they would, someone would jump out, and everything. And people, I want that fish. I want that one. I want that one. But it just created just an excitement, and that's how fresh some of the items that we had. Yeah, the game ward had a little issue with it, but they said it ain't illegal till you get caught. I didn't. Don't quote me on that one. I just throw that in. Yes, sir. 
He said, people are hungry. You get to work and let me finish talking. And uh, where, 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 where's our helper at? Here she comes. While I talk, um, he'll serve. You need another spoon? Excuse me? Oh. oh. Thanks for reminding me. I was trying to avoid that. I'm getting in trouble here. <laughs> but you know, with the family business and, you know, sometimes issues come up where, I hate to say it, sometimes in a family, those things happen. You have to be prepared because decisions can be made and it can affect everybody. You know, you, you really, because we, we have six in our family, so everybody really have to be on the same page. You know, I worked in the business all my life, been with Claire for a long time, and um, so I had more interest in the business being, I'm going to say this, I had more interest in the business being open than some of my siblings had the interest better by being closed. You understand? And I'm gonna kind of leave it like that. But um, but yes, it's it's important, especially with the, with the with so many restaurants that were owned by African and black people in Galveston. It was hundreds of them, and now when you look at it today, you can count them literally on one finger, two finger, one hand. I couldn't understand why, why there were so many at one time. Now the numbers have really declined. So my question is why? How did that happen? Because when you got a lot of uh, 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 men and families who put their, their whole life into operating a business, you would think the kids would have an interest into keeping it going. But um, now, instead of keeping the business going, the children are going into technology. They don't want to work as hard. They just don't want to commit their time and the effort to keep a lot of those business, businesses going. And unfortunately, it's, the, it's one of those harsh realities uh, operating, you know, in African-American business. Uh, whether it be, I, all I know is about restaurant. Uh, we have a few, uh, I know one guy here, he runs a barbecue place, and I don't know who stands in line behind him. So it's just really important that the kids got to keep the kids interested, you got to get them involved, and then you got to really get them while they're young. You got to bring them, bring them up in it. Because once they get it, once that seed is planted, once, once that desire and that love for it, you, 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 you can't let it go. Because this food, this food service industry it's a, it's a beautiful, it's, it's a really, it's rewarding. It's sacrifices. We sacrifice birthdays. Oh, I got to tell y'all this. This is, this is great. This is a great story. I used to interview the employees. Once my dad, he, he just told me what to do. But I used to do the interview. He said, well, I'm going to start interviewing. You're not doing that great of a job. I said, okay. And he will sit somebody down, and I would sit and listen to him. He would sit the person right in front of him, and then he would ask that person, are you a pig or are you a chicken? I said, oh, this is going to be interesting. I really got unbusy. So the the one with the interview was like, well, uh, what do you mean, Mr. Clary? He said, a pig or a chicken. He said, well, let me tell you a story. He said, it was a pig and a chicken ran away from a farm. And they went to the next farm. <laughs> and the farmer asked them, what do you have to offer? And the chicken spoke first. He said, well, I have eggs for your cornbread, for your cake, or you can just scramble them in the morning. The farmer was like, okay, agreed and accepted. Now the pig turned. 
The farmer said, well, what do you have to offer? The pigs say, well, I have to offer and sacrifice my life. Bacon, ham, hocks, the ears, the nose, the pig feet, for those pig feet lovers. So the farmer's like, okay, you're sacrificing your life. So my dad would say again, are you a pig or a chicken? And because he, he told in the, the interviewer, he said, because I don't need any donations. If you're not willing to sacrifice your life for the betterment of my business, that means your birthday, your children's birthday, your anniversary, weekends. No, not your wedding. He'll let you off for your wedding. But he said, if you're not willing to sacrifice these important days, the holidays, if you're not willing to do these things, let me know now. They said, okay, okay. So I guess they agreed to be the pig. So this is where the kicker come in. He will hire them, and they start calling in, start calling in, and start calling in. Then he will say, okay, here, get them to the side. He say, look, I hired you as a pig, but you acting like a chicken. And I don't need you anymore. <laughs> you see the pig chicken theory? It's kind of a harsh thing, but the guys his age, they had a different method of their training, of how we learn. Uh, we, we got it all. If he, he's not mic'd up. But we got it all, oh, goodness oh. gracious. But uh, um, where was I on the pig? But yeah, but uh, uh, working in the restaurant industry, it required devotion. It required dedication. And it required commitment. We had a lot of those waiters. Um, we had the art of going to a table, uh, whether it was two, uh, up to 15, one guy, he had remembered 20, 20 something orders without writing it down. Without writing it down. Can't you imagine? And we had an a la carte menu. You had to order your sides separate. You had to order your dressings, different, four different kinds of dressings. And this guy remembered over 20 something orders. So I was like, how, how were you able to do that? You know one reason why he was able to do it? You know why? Because he could not read and he could not write. And we didn't know that. But his memory was so exceptional. The guy, would, I, I couldn't remember uh, if I was married or not. That's why I have to wear a ring to remind me. I had one time I told, uh, I told somebody, uh, my wife married, I don't know if I am or not. <laughs> but of course, that stopped working. Um, yeah, I stopped working. But it was, the, it was this commitment to these old school waiters. We were, we were brought up by them old school waiters. When you write something down, they will laugh at you. As a matter of fact, they will talk about you. Like, they'll call you, uh, nice names, but they will talk about you if you wrote things down. Am I, am I going over? Um, but, the, but, the, but, but now, you know, the industry have really changed, you know. Um, am I going? Excuse me? Oh. Thank you. Is there any questions? Y'all be, y'all be nice. Y'all be nice. I got a few minutes left, you guys. I, I tell you what, I really appreciate having uh, the opportunity to speak to y'all as well. I really appreciate it. But there's any uh, questions, I'll be happy to do my best and tell you the truth. <laughs> How's it? Yes, sir. Oh, man, that was great. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Um, 
the railroad. Gal going into Galveston, they had a drawbridge for, for the train tracks. The first original drawbridge went like this, and the one they replaced went vertical up and down. So what they needed was during Mardi Gras weekend, they had to replace this bridge with this one, and they had four days to do it. They had 75 engineers and 150 laborers to make sure this operation um, was possible. But during the meantime, what they wanted was, and we had the opportunity to do it, they wanted uh, us to prepare four meals a day, six o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock a.m., 6 p.m. evening, and a midnight meal. We had to have full meals, not snacks, and also in between each session, there had to be a dining room already fully prepared. So for four days, four meals a day, and that alone, that were we able to accomplish. That was, that was huge. We had a dining room here, and we had a, adjacent to that, we had a kitchen where we served everything you could probably think of. For breakfast, we had ham, we had grits, we had oatmeal, and we, we, kept get, we couldn't keep enough Red Bulls for those guys. Those guys stayed up for four days in a row, which means I stayed up four days in a row, too. By the time everybody finished, our eyes were like frogs. But that was, uh, that's probably was one of the most exciting events that uh, I, I, I experienced there. Thank you, thank you, great question, great question. Don't be shy, because I'm not. Uh-oh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's called a Leonville Creole. Yeah, uh, Father, Lebro, Father Lebeau was from Leonville, Louisiana, and is actually named after his hometown, Father Lebeau. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. You remind me of my Aunt Mary Ann. Yeah, my Aunt Mary Ann. She's one of the greatest physical therapists in, in Saudi Arabia. She spent two decades there and came back. Also, my Uncle Clary's brother, Rod Milburn, he was Olympic gold medalist in the 1972 Munich Games. Whoo! Rod Milburn. 110 high. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Huh? Okay. All right, I get that. Anyone else? I got a question back there. Oh, you just messing with me, okay? <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? Also, uh, our, our, our company is still young. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me? Yes, yes, yes indeed, yes indeed. Good question, good question. Although, uh, also, our catering company, it's a little unique. What we do, we do on-site cooking and preparation. What we do, we bring some big box truck, and we unload it, and we have all the equipment, the fryer, the grill, and um, what else? Shaping dishes, smokers, warmers. Um, we prepare, we get about six 12-foot tents and we shade them all around, we throw some flooring down, and we just, and we have a, uh, sometimes we even have a dining room if it's necessary. We had, huh? Porta potties? Sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> but we, 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 we bring all our equipment with us, and then we repair right there, and if there's an event, we'll take everything into the event and line it up, and, uh, and we do salads, we do fresh fruit trays, we have fruit designers. We got a, just a, a whole list of family members and friends that help make this uh, successful. We got a homemade bread pudding that's out of sight, out of this world. Okay, all right. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? You got this a good crowd. Man, you can sometimes you can tell when you when you, you're doing all right, you don't get eggs thrown at you. Exactly. <laughs> and 
So, so that's uh, that's that's it. All right. Okay. Uh, everybody, get a this called Leonville Creole shrimp, ground beef, and dually sausage. Simmon in a red et tu fat sauce with fresh vegetables, bear peppers, onions, mushrooms, and uh, diced tomatoes. Got a little with a little cayenne, a little black pepper, and a little cayenne, a little Creole seasoning. All right. Awesome, awesome. Hey, I have one other thing I'd like to share with you. Someone asked if the books were. Um, for purchase. We are the authors of the book. <laughs> and of course, uh, Mr. Milburn, I, I would have to say this, uh, he almost missed the cut. And I regret that we had to have him in the book because our book was about lost restaurants. We were working on the book when he still was in business. So when he passed, we said, we had no idea whether the family was going to continue with the restaurant, but we knew we had lost Mr. Clary. So that's why he's in the book, and Greg did a wonderful job. I think he, he found family members that were able to share a lot of things with him. So the Lost Restaurant is um, a publication um, written by four of us. The fourth person, Ella Lewis, could be here today. African Americans of Galveston is a book published by Aldous Gaston and I in 2013. All proceeds from the book support Galveston Historic African American Rosewood Cemetery. So if you're interested in learning more about some of the wonderful people we lost in the food industry, you can take a look at that book. Again, too, it's like a, a sprinkle or a pinch or half a cup of recipes in the book, but their stories are so interesting. And as all of us said, many of them came from Louisiana, other parts of Texas, Actually, many of them came to Galveston for jobs. Uh, the dry dock was booming in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, so for a better life. But along the way, they decided they wanted to do something on their own using those skills that they had learned over the years and years. So we thank you again for inviting us here. Um, and um, we have no idea. Well, I'll just say this. <laughs> Alice, no, I said, after the first book, I didn't want to do it again. I'd never done that much. I didn't do that much research in working on my master's degree. Oh, so, uh, but I've enjoyed it. I've learned a whole lot. Uh, some of the restaurants, now Greg, I don't know. He just kind of went like a runaway train. He found restaurants that maybe had been open for only a few months or a few years. But he really pulled in a lot. The section on lost and not forgotten are all offered by Greg. So thank you again. We're enjoying it. And I tell you what, I was hungry when I came in, but I snacked all the way to this stadium, this stage. <laughs> so I'm feeling great. And then I've topped it off with this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.